This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Casey, for reading. And let me add my welcome to Sam's. My name is VJ. I'm uh, one of the ministers here at the church. Can you see the bulletin there? Uh, the inside of that bulletin, you'll really need that today. So I hope you can see that in a Bible. Um, here's a bit of culture just to start us off. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon, who is already sick and pale with grief, that thou, her maid, art far more fair than she. Be not her maid, since she is envious. Her vestal livery is but sick and green, and none but fools do wear it. Um, that, of course, is Shakespeare. Did you read that when you were in school, like I did? Uh, it's Act 2, Scene 2. Uh, of Romeo and Juliet, when Romeo sees Juliet on the balcony and professes his love for her. Uh, it's perhaps the most famous love letter ever written. Uh, Juliet sh shines like the sun. Even the moon is envious and sick with grief. That's the sort of stuff, isn't it, you want to you put in a love letter? It's easy to see why this is so famous. And our passage too um, is a love letter. It's from God to his people. Uh, it's not, you know, over the top like Romeo and Juliet, but I hope you'll think it's every bit as romantic uh, by the time that we are done. Uh, speaking of being done, Joshua is passing on. In verse 2, he says, I'm now well old and advanced in years. In verse 14, he says, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. And so it is final lesson time. There's no more wars to fight, no more battles to be won. It's just the big lessons left from all their adventures so far. Uh, that's what verse 3 reminds them of, all their adventures so far. Can you see it? Verse 3. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I've allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the Great Sea in the West. It's their adventures so far, the fighting, the battles, uh, the promised land to be won. But it is so much more than that. Did you spot the author's emphasis? Uh, the emphasis is how much God favors his people, verse 3, all that the Lord has, the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. In verse 4, it is their land as an inheritance for you. Verse 5, I think, makes it clear. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. On one hand, it's a list of all their adventures so far, but really it's a love letter. A love letter from God to his people. Uh, the emphasis is how much God favors them. Uh, it's what he's done to the nations for Israel's sake. You see, Israel are set apart. They are the apple of his eye. And God is faithful to them as though he's in a relationship with them. And you might be surprised to learn that God could or would play favorites. But remember that the Canaanites had 500 years to repent and join his side. The story of Rahab shows that if at any point they were willing to switch teams and defect, he'd only be too willing to give them mercy and bring them on in. Why wouldn't the nation switch teams and defect? Just look at how he treats his people. Verse 9. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. As for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you. It might not be Shakespeare. It might not sound like our love letters. But it's every bit as meaningful. You see, God is like 
in the nicest possible way. God is like a hopeless romantic. Not he loves you with sentiment and poetry, but he loves you by all of his actions so far. It's there again in verse 14. And now I'm about to go all the way of the earth. You know in your hearts and souls, all of you, not one word of, has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. You see, God is like a desperate spouse. He's a desperate spouse pleading his case. What can that other bloke do for you that I have not done for you already? In three stanzas, it is all the ways he's been faithful and set Israel apart. Why? Because he's trying to fire up their love in return. Uh, loving God, that's a good lesson for the kids, isn't it? A good lesson for us adults, good enough to be a final lesson uh, even for Joshua. Before he goes the way of the earth, he wants to teach them to love God in return. Just have a look at verse 6. Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor the left that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them, but you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. Only a remnant of Canaanites are left after their adventures, but God knows that that is enough, that that is all it will take to lure his people away. And so it is, do not mix, do not even mention don't cling to them, but cling to the Lord. In verse 12, he says, If you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. Do you notice all of a sudden that this love letter has become a warning? He says, if you turn back, um, a snare and a trap, a whip on your sides. Do you know where that language is from? Uh, it's from their slavery in Egypt. You see, in the wilderness, they wanted to turn back to Egypt. Uh, that is where they were snared and trapped. That is where they were whipped um, on their sides. You see, the last time Israel were among the nations, it was when they were enslaved in Egypt. If they want to mix and marry and intermingle, then God will make it as though they never left. They shall be a snare and a trap. Uh, they shall whip you on your sides. You see, the whole story of Joshua is God taking Israel from slavery to the promised land. He reverses their fortunes. But if they reject him and turn back, God will take everything he has done back until you perish from off the good ground that he has given you. He says that language three times in verse 13, 15 and 16, until you perish from off the good land he has given you. They were in slavery, but God reversed their fortunes and brought them a promised land. But if they reject him, God will take it all back, like a reversal of a reversal. And it is so strange, isn't it? Because love letters are supposed to be positive. They're supposed to be romantic. They're supposed to be, I love you because you're wonderful. I love you because you're beautiful. I love you because of the life that we have made together. But this has become a warning. I love you, but don't you let me catch you with another God. And it's not that our God is particularly cruel. It's just the people that he has chosen are particularly unfaithful. And so in verse 6, it is, Be very strong to keep and to do all that's written in the book of the law. Why? Because he knows what his people are like. It is, don't turn aside neither to the left or the right. Why? Because Israel are prone to wander. In verse 11, 
It's be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Uh, that's where unfaithfulness begins, isn't it? Uh, unfaithfulness, disobedience, idolatry, grumbling, pride, they're all Israel's greatest hits. And they all begin in the heart, don't they? You see, the letter is full of God's favour. It's how he fights for them, how he sets them up, uh, sets them apart. All that he's done. Why? Because he's trying to fire up their love in return. Because if he doesn't, they'll intermix, they'll intermarry. And before long, they'll bow down to another God. He knows if he doesn't fire up their love in return, uh, they will be lured away. Why? Because the battle is won and lost uh, in the heart. Remember last week we said, God cares more about our hearts than he does geography. He cares more about the state of our hearts towards him than he does about religious or churchy or spiritual things. And so in verse 6 it is, be very strong to keep and to do. In verse 11, uh, be very careful therefore to love the Lord your God. In other words, you need to guard your heart. In the passage, the thing which affects their hearts is how they interact with the nations. The warning, uh, do not be lured away. And so for us today, do you think the world is trying to trap and snare our hearts? Would you say your family and friends, your colleagues, want you to continue with Jesus? Uh, do the people you know who aren't Christians, would they want you to guard your heart, guard your love for the Lord? You see, if they want to stop Christianity, don't bother hurting us, don't bother opposing us. Uh, hostility only grows the church. Instead, go after our hearts. Lure us away with luxury and pleasure and freedom and vanity and ego, and that will work a treat. And before long, we'll forget all that God has done for us. We'll forget that we are Christians. And that is assimilation. It's everywhere you look, isn't it? Uh, it happens via our schools and our universities that promote certain ideologies. It happens in movies that promote and glorify sex and immorality. Uh, it's in TV shows that tempt us with a grand design home or an escape for the country lifestyle. It's in the advertising which says, well, it's all about me. It's not in your face, is it? It's so much more subtle. Uh, my TV still says Channel 7. Uh, the news is still called Sky News. It's still called the ABC. It's still called the Herald Sun. But there is a controlling narrative amongst the nations. And why? Because they all follow and serve another God. I thought society was so neutral, that journalism was so objective, that movies and TV are just entertainment, that left or right-wing politics was the answer. But it is all separate from the Lord. Why? Because all the nations serve and follow another God. And the danger is that Christians don't have their eyes open to what is going on and that we will be lured away. Why? Because we refuse to guard our hearts. And you might think the solution, therefore, is to create some sort of holy huddle, uh, that we separate ourselves like some sort of Christian bubble, like Israel did with walls and barriers and not into mixing at all but all that will do is trap us in here with a bunch of other human hearts hearts like mine that are prone to wander hearts like mine that are easily lured away and so instead it is verse 6 be very strong to obey in verse 11 be very careful to love the Lord your God they are guarding your heart ideas. It's not quit your job necessarily, but be strong to obey the Lord while you're there. It's not drop your friends necessarily, but it's be very careful 
how you interact when you're with them. Not because your colleagues or your friends are especially sinful. It's that the nations, it's that they serve another God. Uh, There might be situations where you need to quit your job. uh, Where you need to drop that friend. Perhaps your work requires so much of you that you have no time for your family. That you're too exhausted even to come to church. Uh, Maybe in a moment of clarity you realize that your career... That money is slowly moving to the center of things. God's word to you today is, what can that career, what can that money, what can that person give you that the Lord has not already done for you? Um, I had a good friend from the time I was 15 till I was about 25. We were very close. We saw each other almost every day. Um, But it got to the point where I looked at his behavior and I thought, what are you doing? Uh, his behavior, his, his, the way he spoke, uh, the things he did with women on the weekends. Um, I realized it was becoming toxic to my Christianity. And again, not that I am more holy than him. Uh, it's just that I knew myself and I knew that I would be lured away. The passage here today, it warns Israel not to intermarry with the nations, and I guess that's because spouses influence us, that spouses can lead us away. Uh, You might say, well, I I married a non-Christian decades ago, and I still love the Lord. And I would say to you, well done. Uh, God has been very gracious to you. But equally, I'll show you 30 or 40 marriages where the Christian's faith has been utterly shipwrecked. Why? Because they were lured away by their spouses decade after decade. It might work out for some, but if you're not yet married, uh, do you want to roll the dice on your relationship with Jesus? Uh, Rachel and I, we have this saying with our kids. We say we don't mind if our kids dye their hair blue and paint their nails black and get tattoos and piercings, you know, all that stuff that we're afraid of, um, as long as they love the Lord Jesus. Uh, Who they choose to marry will have a huge say in that. Uh, In all our relationships, friends, colleagues, uh, relatives, spouses, future spouses, in all the ways we interact with the nations, the warning is be very strong. It's be very careful. Be very careful to love the Lord your God. Why? Because everyone else you know worships another God. The test, whether you're being lured away, is to ask yourself, uh, who still holds the prime place in your heart? Maybe you need to bring another Christian you trust in on that conversation. Someone who knows you. Uh, Who still holds the prime place in my heart? Can you tell by the way I speak and work and act. And if you realize that something else is moving towards the center, uh, then that is the danger that we are being lured away. The solution um, is this love letter. It's the pattern in this love letter. It is to list out all the things God has done for you, all the ways he's favored you. Why? Because that will fire up your love in return. Uh, If you need a reminder of what God has done for you. Uh, The New Testament is very helpful. Um, Ephesians 2, which is uh, there on the screen. I think that's a really good example. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, Were you once dead in your trespasses? Were you once following the course of this world? But have you now received mercy from God? Has he lavished on you his love? Have you now been made alive with Christ? Have you now been seated with him in the heavenly places? The question is, ask yourself, what can those other gods offer you? Uh, that God has not already done. Uh, Have you had all your sins forgiven? 
Are you going to be safe on judgment day? Can you claim a peace with God? Have you been brought into God's family? Is Jesus your big brother? Do you have hope of eternal life? Is there an immortal body waiting for you? Uh, when it comes to the problem of death, do you have a saviour? Throughout, throughout the letter, the tone is loving and harsh because God is like a desperate spouse. He's a desperate spouse pleading his case. What can that other bloke do for you? That other God, those nations do for you that I have not already done for you uh, in my son. To ask that we love him in return, uh, it almost seems too little. Uh, shall we pray that we would do that? Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful for the Lord Jesus. Our Father, would we never get over that you sent your Son for us? Would we never get over the fact that you love us, that you set your love upon us, that your love is backed up with actions and promises kept, that you love us enough to forgive our sins, to clean us up, to bring us in your family, to give us eternal life. Our Father, let us never forget these things. And we pray, Father, that we would remember so that it fires up our love in return. Uh, we pray, Father, that we would guard our hearts towards you, that we would guard our hearts when we interact with the nations. Our Father, we pray that no one in this church is lured away, that no one's heart is left open to be enticed from the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you that you love us and we beg you for us, for our children, that we would all love you in return. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing.